Hi, I'm Dr. Ollie Pescott from the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology down in Wallingford. There I work within something called the Biological Records Centre, where we deal with species occurrence data of plants and animals for Britain and Ireland. My talk is going to be about alien species and how we distinguish them, what they mean for ecology and all the various topics that that throws up. Well, it's a pleasure to be here at the Gatsby Summer School. It's a real privilege to have been invited and I hope I'm going to talk about something which will be of broad interest to all of you, whether you have a genetic interest, an um, ecological interest or any other type of interest for that matter. Um, I've, I've tried to incorporate into the talk um, a few bits of information about what I do on a, on a daily basis as well, what the kind of broad remit of my job is. As uh, Charlotte said, that's the kind of thing that you'll be interested in. And certainly I know, especially um, when I was coming to the end of my studies, uh, when I went to careers talks, that I always found that the most interesting part, to kind of try and get an insight into what people actually did in their day-to-day -day work. So, on that basis, I've also tried to include examples from uh, my recent field work. So I haven't used too many generic examples of alien plants that you may have already, already heard about. I've tried to include a few kind of unique studies that we've been working on recently at CEH. Um, so very briefly, um, that's my background. I think it's also in the booklet, so I won't go into that too much. But um, I really got into to, to plants during my first degree through volunteering in the Botanic Garden went to work in consultancy, doing site surveys, um, when they're going to build something, put a pipeline through, seeing what's there in terms of the plants, um, and then went on to do a, a population genetics PhD, uh, again, focusing on plants. Um, and from that, um, I worked again in consultancy and then gradually ended up in this, my current role at CEH, which I'll talk about a bit more. Um, so most of my duties are actually to do with what's called botanical recording or biological recording, and I'll go into that again in a bit more detail in a moment. But that's basically dealing with data about plants that have been collected by volunteers, and that includes all of those things there, so databasing, statistics, communication, report and paper writing, of course. Um, I'm from CEH, as Celia said, I felt I should include the corporate slide, especially as this is being filmed, so that I don't get told off later on uh, by the, uh, <laughs> the head of centre. So that's there in the presentation. You can go to the website and find out more about CEH. <laughs> um, <laughs> don't waste too much time on that. But going down to actually where I work within CEH, uh, most of my work is within something called the Biological Records Centre, which I've um, described briefly already. But basically, we're a national focus for all of the recording, all of these people that go out and make observations about plants and animals in the terrestrial sphere. And we've been doing this since uh, 1964, when the first, one of the first national plant atlases was produced. And ever since then, we've been working with these national, we call recording schemes and societies, to collect more and more data about which species occur and where and obviously as you might expect that um, gives us a great insight into how things change over time, how things vary across space and all sorts of other things to do with the ecology of, of plants and animals. Um, so I've said that. We also have people who obviously specialise in analysing these data, um, database developers, web developers, increasingly now app developers as well of course and all sorts of things like that. So that's a kind of broad um, overview of the unit that I work in at CEH. Um, so I've kind of described this already, but there are four main components to a biological record, a piece of information about a species occurrence, so what it was, um, where it was, when the date was that that observation was made, and also who made the observation, which is often quite important for evaluating the trustworthiness of that piece of information, and may be very important for historic records. Um, so that's the type of data we work with. Um, I, as a, I'm mainly a plant ecologist, I specialise in vascular plants, but also mosses and liverworts. So I've chosen, chosen an obscure moss example here. It's this rather beautiful moth called Chista, moss shy called Chistostega panata, which has this um, reflective thallus, which uh, often occurs around disturbed soil and uh, rabbit holes and things, and it reflects light back. So that, that is the, uh, the moss there being reflected out. And this is, this is an observation, biological record, up in the Shetlands of this moss. That's where it was, that's the date, that's the recorder, the person's name and the stage of development. Um, so this is the type of information we have in our database that we use for all of the inferences that we might uh, wish to explore about the species that we're interested in. So one of the, the primary, um, or one of the historical um, aims of this work was originally 
plant biogeography and conservation. So the first national plant atlas that I mentioned, this one here was originally published in uh, 62. And uh, these are the types of maps that were presented. And it's basically for this uh, Parnassia palustris um, here, it's a national map of where it occurs. These are 10 kilometer grid squares. We've also got two different date classes. You probably can't see this. You probably see it better here on this newer map from the update in 2002. So you can start to see historical patterns. So the, the, the light blue dots here are older records pre-1960, the dark blue ones are extant locations. So you can see that that type of information is going to be useful for conservation, for understanding change in the environment. Here, for example, a plant of uh, wetland habitats has declined massively in the lowlands. So that's the type of thing that um, plant data has historically been used for and has been uh, very successful in that, in that avenue. But increasingly, these type of data um, are used to draw all sorts of ecological inferences, to look at change in all sorts of ways. And this is just a random set of papers which our unit has published over the last 10 or 15 years. So using these types of data, we've looked at things like the effect of atmospheric nitrogen deposition on changes in diversity over time, looking at how traits and phylogenetics influence or, or are reflected in different changes in different species, um, more to the point, looking at different things um, relating to alien plant distributions, um, looking at upland plants and how they might be affected by climate change. So all these types of things, it's not just about biogeography. And of course, all of this data increasingly gets put forward into global databases as well. I don't know if you're familiar with the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, uh, GBIF, you can go to this website and they've just had an update and this is one of the new type of maps where all the data that's collected in Britain, this is a, an invasive non-native species for Britain, actually the water fern, and and this is the type of map you get back. Looks like there are some erroneous information out in the sea there. I'm not sure that's obviously an error. So you have to be careful of using this type of data as well. You can't always take it at face value. And uh, that kind of feeds into what I said earlier about being able to trust data, having the maximum amount of information as possible attached to a record. Often when things get aggravate, aggregated internationally, some of that gets lost. Um, so, that's really what our unit does. You know, we record data increasingly through apps, um, traditionally through paper forms. There's this kind of verification process where people check it. It gets shared on websites or in published books like those atlases I was talking about. Um, and then people like ourselves academic and academic scientists as well um, at universities do research. And then hopefully that leads through to some sort of response in terms of changing management, informing conservation policy, um, make, making people think about fundamental ecological processes um, and things like that and this is the uh, number of records over time and you can see it's you know there's been an exponential increase over the past 10 years mainly because of increases changes in technology and the number of atlases that we've been publishing has been going up as well so it's a huge amount of information coming through this route and I just wanted to describe this to start start with to give you an idea of the type of data that feeds into all of the other things I'm going to speak about in the context of alien plants um, so I don't know when you saw the description of this talk in the, in the programme, whether you knew much about alien plants already, I'm sure lots of you will have heard stories about Japanese knotweed, giant hogweed, things like that. So I'm probably assuming that you probably have a, a vague idea at least um, of, of what an alien species is. But I've just included some basic definitions um, just so we're all talking about the same things. And in this area, terminology is really important because people do often use um, one word to use sometimes subtly different things. Um, but fundamentally, a native species, and obviously I'm talking mainly about Britain and Ireland in this talk, is one which arrived in the area without any intervention by man. Um, so an alien or a, a non-native, they're interchangeable really, is one which was brought into the study area by man, regardless of whether man meant to do it or not. And an invasion is any type of range expansion in which the transport of that organism was caused initially by human but then spread further. And an invasive species is one which has spread rapidly but it's also having some sort of undesirable impact. So I often in this talk refer to alien invasive species so obviously that's something that's brought to Britain or Ireland by man whether intentionally or not and is having some sort of undesirable impact and we'll talk a bit more about what that means as I go through and I've tried to minimize the number of text slides in this so there are quite a number of pictures and fewer boring slides like that last one. So since 1958 when Charles Elton who was one of the leading animal ecologists or if not the leading animal ecologist of his time um, he wrote this book in 58 called The Ecology of Invasions by Animals and Plants and then you can see the field kind of 
ticked along for a little while. This is the number of citations uh, of his book over time and the number of general papers on invasion biology. And then about the early 90s, after a particular international research project, it just, the field just took off. And it's a, a, a really big area of research these days. And there are several specialist journals dedicated to it. So what's the size of the issue in, in Britain? I mean, what, what, do we, what are we talking about when we talk about alien species? And this is just all aliens, not just the ones that might be having undesirable impacts. And this map here is from the 2002 National Plant Atlas, um, based on all of that volunteer data that I was talking about. So this is collected mainly by members of the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland. Um, and this is just the species richness of um, plants which arrived after 1500, which have this... Um, jargony term of neophytes. So you can see uh, the darker dots are up to about 200 species. So, you know, around London, Birmingham, uh, parts of the south, southwest and the south coast, you know, in a 10 kilometre grid square, you sometimes got up to 100 or 200, 300 species um, which were brought to, to Britain by man and uh, have some degree of establishment or, or presence in that area. These are just some of the, the top 10 in terms of the number of grid cells covered. So things like horse chestnuts, sycamore, Italian ryegrass, um, snow um, things that you probably see every day but perhaps don't notice like pineapple weed um, and a few agricultural weeds and things there. Um, so there are huge numbers of these plants but obviously only a very small number um, go on to spread and have impacts and we'll come on to that a bit more in, in, in the, the future slides. Um, so obviously there are various ways in which species can move around. Um, some of them are brought on purpose for things like horticulture and forestry. Um, so we've been doing um, some work in Cyprus recently, and I'll talk a bit more about this. Um, but this is uh, from a forestry report in 1915 that I um, photocopied at the, the National Archives. And this is just a short list of some of the many species that were tried for forestry and horticulture for various purposes in Cyprus around 1915. So you can see there are all sorts of things coming uh, from California, South Africa, other, uh, even species which were not native to England, but which have come via England from other parts. That's from South America originally. Um, so huge numbers of species that are being brought in everywhere all the time and tried out for various purposes. There are also ones, of course, that come as contaminants. So obviously a lot of our spe alien species, which have been in Britain for a very long time, originally came over in the Bronze Age um, um, with uh, agriculture. So things like the um, uh, Papaver hybridum here, um, the, uh, I forget the common name, the um, spiny poppy. Um, so there are lots of different ways in which species can come, but of course those are some of the, the main routes by which ma many of our um, long-established, well-established non-native species have arrived in Britain. Um, increasingly, as there are databases of things like trade flows around the world um, and um, the connectivity between regions in terms of that. You've, in fact, this I don't think you can probably see the map there. There's supposed to be a map of the world there, and this is a map of Europe behind it. But that, the point is that there's, these days there's so much information available about agricultural trades. You can download um, databases from the internet, and you can kind of work out globally all the flows of trade around the world. So these are all kind of products which have moved from North America, South America, Africa, Asia, into the EU. And um, my, these colleagues of mine did this study and uh, really looked at how all these different types of trade networks influence the species, the pest species that are arriving into, into um, the European plant protection area and within the European plant protection area. Um, and this kind of connectivity around the world was actually the best explanatory variable for the current patterns of invasive species, not just plants, but also insect pests and other pathogens in the EU. So there's a huge amount of data out there on this now, and we're being able to really put numbers on these, um, the influences of these types of international movement of species around the world, um, which previously we've only been able to make kind of vague statements about like these, um, which I gave here about agriculture and forestry and things like that. Um, so what's the situation in Britain at the moment? Um, so we've got about 1,500 established non-native plants, um, about uh, 400 or so animals. Um, I've tried to focus mainly on plants because I'm a plant ecologist, but here and there I have popped in a few facts about animals, partly because um, a good friend of mine, Helen Roy, who's a ladybird ecologist, uh, kind of put me on to this, this talk, and uh, she'd be dismayed if I didn't mention ladybirds at least once during the talk, so they'll come up later. Um, but of those um, about 2,000 species, plants and animals that have arrived in Britain, there are only about um, 200 have had some sort of, or have been designated as having some sort of negative impact. 
So it's only a relatively small fraction, and as you can see, it's only about 96 or 6 percent of established alien plants that are thought to be having some sort of impact. And of course, it depends how you define that, but it is actually quite a small number which are actually designated as invasive and having some sort of undesirable effect on the environment. So we have to keep that in mind when we're talking about alien organisms and not get too hysterical about the, what's really happening. So I've talked about impact several times, but it's a very generic word, isn't it? I mean, what do we really mean when we're talking about impact? So lots of things that we could mean. Um, and this can be divided up in many, many ways. But the things that ecologists normally mean when they're talking about this area are impacts on other species and communities. So a plant having reducing the species richness or the diversity in some other way of either a plant or animal community. And the implication there is that the impact is mainly on native species um, that were already there for some period of time. And an alien species has come in and affected them in some way, reduced their abundance, caused them to go locally extinct, or perhaps interacted with some feeding interaction if it was an insect or something like that. Um, a bit more abstractly, there are also impacts on ecosystem processes. So these are things um, which would be um, abiotic processes of the ecosystem, such as um, nitrogen mineralization or soil organic content and things like that, um, kind of physical processes that we might want to measure. So an invasive species might have some sort of impact on that process. Um, there are also impacts on the genetics, potentially, if a species can hybridize with a closely related species. I'm not going to cover that in this talk, but it's something that, that can happen and has happened. And of course, finally, there are impacts on humans, potentially, socioeconomic impacts. Um, so probably what ecologists think about first when they do talk about impacts uh, of invasive species on native species are these biodiversity impacts where you're reducing potentially the species richness of a site and impacting on native species. So there are lots of examples that um, can be given in this context uh, for Britain and all around the world. Um, but I've just taken one kind of at random and this is one um, that Plant Life have on their website because they're doing some management there at the moment on the Gower Peninsula. And, um, this may not come through so well in the picture here, but you've got some uh, kind of stands of this low-growing um, subshrub here, a cotoneaster. Most of the invasive cotoneasters in Britain come from China. Um, I think there are several small leaf species that are well established on the Gower. And so these species um, originally introduced into gardens in Britain. Now they're being moved into natural, semi-natural habitats by birds and seeds eating the fruits and uh, dropping the, the seeds out here and have obviously start established. And so these are obviously causing quite a lot of ground cover and they're affecting lots of, lots of other species which are found there, such as the yellow whitlow grass here and basil thyme and lots of other species there. So that's a, quite a clear um, picture of a, one species coming in, a large woody species, and then having some direct impact on some other species that are native and therefore <clears throat> we assume have some value and we want to conserve. So that's quite a common story in invasion biology um, and is replicated around the world in lots of different situations. Um, and ecologists have actually looked at this and looked at all of the studies that have been done on that type of system all around the world and then taken all of those studies and done something called a meta-analysis, <coughs> which some of you may have heard of, which is a particular statistical technique for bringing together all these um, measured impacts in all sorts of systems and summarising it in a statistically valid way and saying what the overall um, conclusion is from all of those studies. So you can see here, um, this is a, a kind of general impact, if you will, um, we'll just call it. All of these measures here, you can see a negative impact of an alien invasive species on, and this is always native plant growth, native plant abundance, native diversity, native fitness. <coughs> the only one which increases is plant production, and that's typically because the production of the invasive species is included in the measure of productivity um, of the ecosystem. So you can see there that it's, it's not really surprising um, in a way because you might ask, well, this is probably quite biased because invasion biologists are probably going to get funded to study species that have high impacts because that's deemed to be an interesting study, uh, study system to look at. So you can query this and you can say, well, actually, it's not really surprising because all of those studies are going to look at big things which are having obvious impacts because the scientists have got funds to study them. Um, and that's a very valid criticism. This is probably a very biased picture of what 
um, alien species actually do. It's only really looking at those very invasive ones that have big impacts. So if we look at some other alien species in Britain, um, this is one called Veronica filiformis, which if we went out and hunted around the turf around this building, we'd probably find it's kind of very small and moved around with lawn mowers, uh, often just growing amongst the turf. Um, this is a nice little one that's often found around lampposts and things. Uh, Clato Claytonia befoliata. Um, again, probably doesn't have any impacts on anything that you'd really care about. Um, so we have to keep a, a sense of perspective and think that actually overall alien species might not be having these types of effects, but these are the ones which the very invasive ones are having. So it's always important to keep these kind of qualifications in mind when you're looking at and reading about this topic. Um, so in terms of impacts on processes, as you might expect, um, impacts on things like soil um, nutrient cycling, uh, carbon accumulation in soils, uh, mineral weathering, all of those things are kind of tend to be far less well studied, typically because they're harder to study and require um, more time, more equipment, more funding and all those types of things. Um, but there is a, still a body of evidence of impacts of invasive species, invasive plants on those uh, measures. Um, I mean, in some cases, you look at a, an invaded landscape and you think, well, there couldn't possibly not be an impact because the species is so abundant. Um, this is in, in Portugal um, on a species I was working on recently called Hachia sericea, originally from Australia. It was introduced widely throughout the Mediterranean, mainly as a hedge because it's ex extremely spiny. And, um, and from there, it's spread out into the wider countryside in Mediterranean regions. So this blanket of green here is all Hachia sericea, and you would not be able to walk through that, uh, trust me. But the thing is, um, this is also a highly flammable species, as a lot of things are from uh, Mediterranean systems, or most things are. Um, so it's definitely going to increase fire intensity in that system. And um, you probably saw there are some very awful um, wildfires in the news in Portugal last week. And um, this species thrives on fire and um, the seeds actually open on burning. So that kind of feedback is also, um, uh, can change a system wholesale and completely um, alter the, all of the processes and all of the diversity in an area potentially. So you can think there, something that big, if that burns, there's definitely going to be some impact on some element of the soil um, biota and, and abiotic properties. Um, so overall, that paper that I looked at, that meta-analysis, they also looked at all of these um, abiotic soil properties and tried to look at um, what the impacts were across all of the studies that had looked at those types of things, um, such as productivity, microbial activity. And you can see here, actually, this is the effect size again. Lots of them actually had positive impacts. So the presence of an alien invasive species actually increased available nitrogen, phosphorus became more available, organic matter in the soil went up, it's more nitrogen, um, more nitrification going on. So actually, um, lots of these things, um, the alien plants are actually coming in and, and changing the system, but they're increasing um, things in the system. But it's very hard to say, isn't it, whether that's good or bad. I mean, you can take the perspective that any, that that native system was at some sort of perfect equilibrium and any change therefore must be bad. But I mean, that kind of paradigm of balance in ecology is, is very outdated and outmoded. And most of the evidence in ecology over the last 40, 50 years has been far more uh, showing that ecological systems are quite unpredictable, quite chaotic, uh, perhaps locally contingent on history or the, um, the random order in which species occur and um, a, a come, arrive at a site, sorry. Um, so it's very hard to look at this and say, well, actually, that's bad. It's just an impact. And obviously, if something's extremely abundant and large, a large woody species or something that can um, be set on fire very easily, then it's not too surprising um, that you're going to have um, big impacts. So you need to be a bit careful uh, when thinking about this as well. Um, the next thing is really the socioeconomic impacts. And these are the reasons why we often read about them in our newspapers, because they've had some impact on people. Or, or something that people do, such as buying and selling houses. Um, you may have uh, seen this in the media over the last few years about Japanese knotweed and the impacts on buying and selling houses. You know, now when a, a conveyance uh, does the survey of all the various things you need to think about when you buy and sell house, whether or not you have Japanese knotweed on your property is one of the boxes that that conveyancer has to tick. And 
if you as a, as a homeowner or a property owner um, have knotweed on your land and allow it to spread onto a neighbour's land or onto land that somebody else owns, then you could actually get hit by an antisocial behaviour order. So, you know, it is having a big impact on the housing market, potentially on people's ability to sell their homes. Um, so we may ask, well, is it, is it getting blown out of proportion? Is it, is it justified? Uh, and I'm not here to pass judgment on that. I'm just noting that species, if they get to a certain abundance, and this is um, a predicted uh, abundance model for Japanese knotweed across the whole of Britain, um, they can obviously start to have a big impact on how people um, think about that plant and how they go about their daily lives. Um, so now I, I have put in a non-plant example to keep Helen happy when she uh, listens to this video. And this is about the, uh, the Harlequin ladybird, which comes in several lovely colour forms. That's just one of them there. There is a black and red one too. This is the spread of the species um, from when it, when it first arrived in 2003 up to about 2014. The colours kind of going as the northwest as the species moves through the country. And, and this is a species that has been shown, uh, again, through data that have been collected by these volunteer amateur naturalists going out and recording other species. And they have been able to show these are eight other native uh, ladybird species. And the lines here are for two different countries. The red ones are in Belgium and the black ones are Britain. Uh, and here we have um, the dotted line is when Harlequin, the invasive ladybird, was actually present. And um, the solid one is when it was absent. So the modelling that was applied to these data did consistently show that in those grid cells where the Harlequin had arrived, each of these species, those dotted lines, or almost all of them, um, had some sort of significant decline. So you can see there that, you know, there often is something to be interested in and concerned about if we are concerned about um, conserving native species. And that's just the same for plants. It just, we had a, a good example from our Institute for Ladybirds, so I put it in. Um, so people have also looked at these impacts and tried to cost them. And often this is a bit hand-waving and a bit kind of, you know, finger in the wind and we'll come up with some numbers. Um, but be that as it may, um, for established non-native species, um, that are having some sort of impact. The estimated cost of controlling them is currently about you know, 12 billion euros per year. Um, and that's obviously increased dramatic, uh, sorry, dramatically over time. And um, this is the number of new species increasing, sorry, rather than the cost. Um, and that's the one with um, some sort of human impact. So you can see, at least from the perspective of uh, people who are dealing with these things on an everyday basis, you know, the problem has been increasing and the need to, to control some of these species has been increasingly in the public's mind um, and, and hitting people's purses. So we also, when we think about these, um, the need to control species or think about what impact they might be having, which might influence our decision whether we want to spend money on controlling them, one of the other things we need to think about is really whether we understand the evidence that we've got. Um, if you think back to some of those maps that I've shown of those dots um, showing where something is, you know, if you look at that, you might think, oh, a species is extremely widespread. It's in all of those 10 kilometre dots across the whole of Britain. Uh, and those dots that I've shown on some of those maps are called hectares, 10 by 10 kilometres. But of course, um, it really depends what type of scale you look at. Just because a, a species has been observed in one of those squares, it may just be a single plant in somebody's, next to somebody's garden. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, dominated the, uh, you know, a large swathe of countryside uh, in Middle England somewhere. So it, when you look at this problem at smaller scales, if you go down to two kilometres, this is for Japanese knotweed again, and then if you go down to sites of special, special scientific interest, or even smaller, um, these are sites of nature conservation interest in Dorset. Um, the, num the frequency and the percentage of, of those sampling units you know, goes down. So actually, in quite a lot of cases, species aren't really as widespread as we think they are from some of the monitoring data. When you actually look at places where you might want to be concerned about them, such as the nature reserves, they're actually quite rare. Um, so it might ha influence how you think about the problem, how you allocate funds to dealing with it. Of course, in those sites where it's present, it may, there may be an impact on, on native species. So you may want to be concerned, you may want to allocate funds for management. But when you look at these kind of various claims about the impact of alien species, you need to kind of keep this in mind and evaluate the evidence that you're being shown and think about whether there's that kind of scaling effect that may be influencing how you're thinking about the problem. Um, because really, when we come and think about um, 
alien plants in the context of conservation. It's all very much about how we value nature and how we value what we have already. Any decision about controlling an invasive alien, an invasive plant, it presupposes that what we value, uh, we value what we already have at that location, um, which is a native plant, which just so happened to make it here um, after the last glaciation, uh, you know, um, on, under its own steam. And it's kind of arbitrary in a way, because the species that made it here after this glaciation and after the rise of the channel, not necessarily the same set of species that made it in a previous interglacial or even, you know, a million years ago, obviously. So it's very much um, a cultural process of deciding that we want to protect our native flora and fauna and protect them from impacts from invasive species. Um, and it's good to be clear about that, because if you're going to... Um, adduce some sort of scientific argument for controlling a species and spending money on it and protecting native species. It's good to be clear that you are doing something which is, at least in a, on a geological or evolutionary time scale, is ultimately fairly arbitrary. Um, so there's no, there's no real scientific basis for saying that we should conserve local diversity. Um, I mean, there are various studies about linking biodiversity function uh, to diversity, but there's no um, intrinsic scientific reason that I'm aware of that um, diversity that supports an ecosystem function should be native diversity. It could just as well be alien diversity. So there's no real scientific basis um, to this decision. It, things have always moved around, as I said, thinking about the previous interglacials. So really, being in favour of some sort of control in these situations where we might have an invasive plant affecting native species is very much a cultural decision that implies we, we value things on a human time scale and we have a human perspective rather than an evolutionary one. But that's not really unusual, is it? I mean, all the decisions we make are based on our human time scales. But it's, uh, it's good to be clear about that when you're trying to make scientific arguments about the need to control an alien species. Um, because if you start pretending that it's scientific, you're likely to get uh, undermined and found out and uh, be held up for, for being rather fraudulent. It's also rather a slippery slope of an argument. Um, you may have heard of the sadly departed um, evolutionary uh, biologist Stephen Jay Gould, who wrote a number of popular books about evolution, which some of you may have read. So he was saying this kind of uh, policy that always saying that native species are best is rather a slippery slope because it has this kind of um, implicit attitude that something that's natural and native must be right and best. And you can easily slide into saying that, well, my native is best and yours is, he said here, only fit for extirpation. And actually, this has actually happened in the past. If you go back to the Second World War, um, there were German botanists and people involved in, in planting alongside um, the creation of the, the Reichsautobahn in Germany, who made these arguments about not using alien plants and only using native plants because it was more pure and more in keeping with the, the National Socialist ideology of that time. And you can see here a botanist in 1942 saying, you know, comparing this fight against alien plants to the fight against Bolshevism. So here, the fight against this Mongolian invader that's affecting the beauty of the home forest, what they're actually referring to there is this species. So that kind of... Um, that tone and that language is very, uh, a very emotional way of approaching, approaching biology. And it has been used to quite sinister effect in the past. And obviously I'm not saying that people uh, in Britain who uh, talk about alien species do that today. But as Gould pointed out, it's a kind of slippery slope and you have to be careful what the implications of what you're saying are. Um, because you, know, you can get uh, dangerously close to xenophobia with some of, these, um, some of the language that's used in the area. And uh, invasion biologists, to be fair, have pointed that out as well in the, in the literature. Um, so I'm just going to give a few uh, slides now about um, how changing values can um, change landscapes as well. How people approach plants can cause wholesale transformations to, to landscapes. And this has happened around the world in lots of places, but it's just that I've been in Cyprus recently and done some archival research over there. So I thought I'd put this in. Um, and these are uh, nice photos from the National Archives who hold all of the archives of the colonial office, um, which includes all of the things like the, the, the foresters that used to, lots of, you know, if this was 50 years ago, maybe some of you would have gone off to be foresters in the colonial service, something that botanists did quite a lot in those days. Um, so this is all about planting up um, 
parts of the Mediterranean with non-native species for various other purposes. Um, here we're draining wetlands, so this is a, a native um, Junker salt meadow in Cyprus, um, now an endangered habitat. It's on the Annex 1 of the uh, European Commission Annex 1 Habitats Directive. Um, and at that time, you know, they were very keen on ditching and banking and planting these um, Australian eucalyptus trees in order to dry it out to try and combat malaria. Um, and this happened all throughout Cyprus in, well, in, in, very, in, in lots of different places. Um, so this is Cyprus, just to give you an idea. Um, this peninsula here is a big wetland, a big salt lake with lots of flamingos. And there's a very valuable wetland here. And most of this area, um, which is being flagged up here as the home of this particular mosquito species, this is from a uh, report from 1942, I think. Um, and this whole area now is a eucalyptus forest. And also around here, a large amount of eucalyptus planting. And obviously, you know, introducing non-native species to that extent and facilitating it um, you know, with various ditching and banking and all that type of thing has had huge impacts on the native species there and transformed the landscape. Um, so they did it all throughout the island um, and not just eucalyptus as well. Another, th another thing that was big back then was using acacias from Australia to sta stabilise sand dunes along roads to control, to control sand dunes and also to provide wood for people. So producing these kind of um, forest fuel areas for villagers. And all of the, the orange areas here, you won't be able to read that probably, but these orange bits are all plantations that were established by the British in Cyprus um, between 1878 and 1928. This was kind of celebrating 50 years of uh, being the protector of Cyprus. And so you can see... And this really underestimates the impact as well of these changes on the landscape. And in particular, the acacia that they introduced is now um, extremely widespread throughout Cyprus, Cyprus. And it's their number one invasive species affecting all sorts of in interesting habitats, not just wetlands, but um, low subshrub communities that you find throughout the Mediterranean and things like that. So here we've got, um, this is a forester, in 19, uh, 1927, I think, this photo. And what this shows, this was all um, what's called frigana. It's like a spiny subshrub heath. But what would it, that's what would have been there. But what you can actually see here is a blanket of acacia. And this has been a tractor cern. So they've driven a, a tractor with a plough through this habitat and just cern acacia all through it. And, and now they wonder why it's a, it's a, well, they don't wonder, they know that this, this is why it's a, an invasive species in Cyprus. It just was introduced everywhere with such, again, this kind of blanket uh, approach that it's, it's now extremely well established. And, you know, you find it everywhere up to about 800 metres. And it, you know, it probably is having quite big impacts on, on uh, the plants that were there before, undoubtedly, and probably insects that depended on them as well. But of course, at that point, this was felt to be a hugely beneficial thing for Cyprus. And um, it was being celebrated in this um, rather propagandist map that was produced for the 50th anniversary um, of the British being there. So you can see that, and this is just um, us a couple of years ago, this is the big salt pan in the distance. And this is the acacia invading various types of um, salt marsh habitat around the lake, all of this here. So you can see, you know, the type of impacts that might arise from decisions that are made um, because of changing values through time and the way that people might choose to value a habitat and choose to value the, the ecosystem service of wood or of reducing malaria or something else um, against and valuing that against um, a native species. So with the eucalypts, that's also having uh, big impacts around the Mediterranean. So this is for Portugal, which I mentioned earlier with those wildfires that we uh, sadly saw a couple of weeks ago. And it's, uh, so Portugal is one of the biggest producers of um, eucalypts for, for wood pulp industry in the EU. And they've got huge numbers of plantations there. And this heat map here is um, a national, the results of a national survey looking at um, the rate of establishment or the number of established saplings of the eucalyptus species that have been planted there. Um, and it's, this is from Cyprus, but this is um, the type of habitat that you might find. So this is the density. So we've got these red ones here, between 1,000 and 10,000 plants per hectare of um, eucalyptus saplings. So you can imagine um, the type of impacts that's having on the lands or has had on the landscape of Portugal. And if you think that the, um, these trees are all extremely flammable and the accumulation of litter in these forests is pretty impressive as well, um, it's not really surprising that they're extremely prone to, to bursting into fire through lightning and having huge impacts across the whole landscape. 
And, you know, you have to trade that off against the value of the, the eucalypt uh, industry to Portugal. Um, but of course, if there are this density of saplings uh, across the landscape, it's highly likely they're going to be encroaching onto other habitats, which um, the Portuguese value for them having been there for a long time and treating them as native habitats that they attach an intrinsic value to. So it's not surprising that they're, they're rather concerned about the potential of eucalypts to transform their landscape, especially under climate change scenarios. Um, and a similar type of thing has happened in Britain as well. In the, the late Victorian times in the early 20th century, rhododendron was hugely popular for ground cover for estates, um, for, for game, uh, and just for beautifying, um, you know, highland estates and things uh, throughout Britain. So uh, in 1912, in, this is an advertisement in the garden, which is a, a garden periodical. You could buy, um, I think it's 105 shillings for a thousand seeds of you, um, sorry, rhododendron. And so it was just blankets uh, throughout the, you know, throughout estates, um, throughout Scotland and in, and in parts of England. So it's not really surprising that there are now um, valleys and ravines in North Wales, Snowdonia, for instance, um, large parts of the highlands where rhododendron is a huge pest because it was introduced um, at, on such a grand scale that it could hardly fail to establish and have impacts. Uh, um, one of the things that we often overlook when we're thinking about impacts is also the impacts on on smaller forms of biodiversity. So like the mosses and liverworts and lichens and perhaps soil biota, I haven't really mentioned. Um, but rhododendron uh, woodlands in Scotland have been shown to be quite poor for, for lichens and, and mosses and liverworts. And these are groups which we have actually quite a big responsibility for internationally. Um, the Atlantic Western, Northwestern coast of Britain is extremely important internationally for its um, liverworts and its mosses and its lichens. So, you know, there could be quite big, or well, there have been shown to be very big impacts um, of rhododendron in those areas. Um, and this is not really typical, it's just an isolated bush, but it's kind of easier to photograph than a dense um, canopy of rhododendron. Um, so the impacts and how we perceive them also depend on where you are. Um, if you're in a city, and most of the nature that you see is actually alien species. If you're walking along a canal, this is kind of rather an old fashioned uh, picture here, but this was probably the book that kind of popularized the concept of nature in cities, as it were, or got people to value it more at least in the 19, uh, early 1970s. Um, but of course, if you're using these areas or walking in cities and most of the plants and animals that you see perhaps along a canal or in a city park are in fact non-native species then obviously those have a big value for you and the fact that they're there is much better than having nothing and so an alien species in the center of, of Sheffield or wherever might actually be very important and it might be important for wildlife as well. Um, it's a very famous urban ecologist from Sheffield actually um, Oliver Gilbert who um, found that there were communities of plants um, which kind of res resembled the spring flora in woodlands that had developed under the canopy of Japanese knotweed because the knotweed develops later in the season. So it was kind of like um, the way in which things like bluebell and wood anemone, uh, moshatel, those types of woodland herbs that flower in the spring before the, the leaf canopy comes out, these things had kind of washed down uh, from woodlands higher up in the, in the Pennines and then established under the Japanese knotweed. And the knotweed was then acting as the kind of deciduous canopy for them. So actually there you had this kind of completely new community that had been uh, formed in an urban area with an invasive species and native species and was probably widely appreciated by people walking along the canal. And there was also evidence of use by water voles as well. So the impacts that we think about, again, you know, you can't generalize too much. Um, invasion biologists often say that you shouldn't really speak about invaders because a species is not always invasive. It's populations or instances of species that are invasive rather than the species per se. A species might uh, be perfectly non-invasive in several situations and then invasive in another. So it's all very context dependent when you're thinking about these impacts and how people might value them. Um, here's another example that um, came up when I was um, a PhD student in Sheffield. Um, this is the Natural History Society in Sheffield, um, which is a very good one. Um, but they had a, a newsletter and, you know, people often wrote in with observations. I mean, these are often the type of people writing in that also contribute the data that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in which I spoke about at the beginning. Um, also, these uh, amateur naturalists also make 
all sorts of other interesting observations. And this chap here was, he'd seen um, walking through a woodland, he'd seen a big pile of Himalayan balsam that had been pulled, in other words, um, you know, harvested, pulled out of the ground and left in a pile, obviously some sort of control activity from a local conservation group. And he was saying, well, I wonder what the point of doing this is. I can't see any rare plants growing around here. You know, why are we bothering? It's just a waste of time. The only rare plants are, are perennials. I don't think they're going to be affected by Himalayan balsam. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm maybe, being, maybe I'm being grumpy, but I think it's a waste of time. And, you know, uh, naturalists being vocal people, he soon got a reply. And the group which were involved in the, uh, in the, in the, the Himalayan balsam pool, you know, they said, well, Actually, actually, Ken, you know, we, this was their justification. We, we did it to try and regain some of the botanical diversity in the ancient woodlands, small remnants of unimproved grassland and marsh, and they're all habitats that we feel are locally important. They're saying there's a shortage of unimproved grassland in Derbyshire, so we're concentrating on that habitat. So again, you've got local context that you always need to take into, into consideration. You know, at the national scale, you, you might be right in saying there's very little point in controlling this species, actually, because it's everywhere. Uh, and, and Himalayan balsam is more or less everywhere. I mean, it's very common in wet woodlands. Um, but even locally, these people are saying, well, actually, we consider that the way we value unimproved grassland, which is very rich, semi-natural grassland with lots of flowers. You know, those people obviously have a concept of what a, a native habitat is locally, what the native species are locally that they appreciate and the ones that they see. And they're obviously willing to invest effort, um, despite the grumpy old botanist, in, in uh, removing this plant. So it's, it's a very complex area in that you, it's very hard to generalise about what's the best course of action for any invasive plant. And it's very much more site-specific, population-specific, um, uh, and uh, locally contingent, but I'm sure perhaps if you're familiar with ecology, you, you probably think that ecologists always say that about everything, that everything's very complex and locally contingent, but um, there are people that um, make broad generalisations in ecology as well, um, so it's good to have some of the, the local particularities brought into focus as well, I think. So just for the last uh, five minutes, I'm just going to talk about some of the research which is ongoing that I'm involved in at CEH and the types of things we're trying to do um, to ward off future invasions where we think there would probably would be uh, large scale impacts. Although that's not to say that if some of these things arrived, people might not, some people would obviously appreciate them. So a lot of work we do now is predicting what's likely to come next and have, and have considerable impacts. So we were involved in a study recently um, where we did something called horizon scanning, um, which is basically a group of experts sitting around and pooling their knowledge and trying to go through some sort of consensus building process to agree on scoring species in terms of their likelihood of arrival, what their impacts are likely to be, how likely they are to establish, and all these other sorts of things so that you can then prioritise perhaps lawmaking or um, biosecurity or management, early detection and eradication, all those types of things. Um, so there are all sorts of things that have been flagged up and this was published three years ago now. Um, and this was led by my colleague, Helen Roy. Um, and again, this was often quite heavily dependent on volunteer collected data about species, but often volunteer collected data from France or Belgium or other places where species had already arrived. So things like the emerald ash, ash borer, which um, could have huge impacts on, on ash woodlands in Britain. Um, the Asian hornet, which has arrived once or twice now, but been eradicated because of early detection. Um, but if it came, it could have big impacts on native pollinator communities and honeybees. Um, so all sorts of things like that. So that's a big part of our work now and something that I think about quite a lot. Um, and in pursuance of that, we do quite a bit of modelling as well. So if any of you are interested in statistics, this is a kind of um, type of thing that we often do as well. So here we've used, um, this is about assessing the risk of um, this particular alien plant, Ambrosia confertiflora, which is one which produces um, a large amount of very allergenic pollen, which is a big problem in North America. And lots of people are very um, allergic to it. So it's one that um, the authorities are very keen on detecting early. So what we've done here is used information on the range. Again, lots of this information would be collected by amateur naturalists 
uh, in southwestern USA. We've kind of mapped the climate space and then compared that to the climate space of the EU and then worked out where that would occur in the EU. So it's mainly Spain and Portugal, um, Sicily and parts of Greece that would potentially be suitable climatically for that species. And again, that helps to um, lead to legislation, um, perhaps for the whole of the EU. Um, we now actually have an EU regulation on invasive aliens. So there's a list which species can be put on, which could ban them from being imported or traded within the EU. And we're involved in a big project at the moment with the European Plant Protection Organization on doing pe pest risk analysis for these plants that we, oh, I'm doing it for plants anyway, other people do it for other taxa. And basically what that involves, um, and again, this is an area that you might not be aware of as a potential career, but these are people who are kind of plant protection experts for their countries. So they, they deal in things like pathogens and pests, biosecurity. And for these pest risk analyses, you all get together in a room and you kind of thrash through a draft of a document over a week, you know, minutely editing all the details. And then that gets sent to the European Commission. You end up with some document that's for that species that's widely established in Portugal that I mentioned earlier. So it's another um, uh, interesting career opportunity for botanists, you know, thinking about biosecurity, increasingly with the regulation from the EU um, and these international or, or EU uh, level organisations like EPO uh, and similar around the world. Um, I've, I've kind of covered this already, but another thing that we're very active in, in at BRC is about early detection and increasingly that's covered by things like new technology. We have quite a lot of um, recording apps which you might want to look at, as well as this one which focuses on alien plants. There's a, there's a general plant and animal species recording app which is available there, freely available, and that's where a lot of our interactions with amateur naturalists are moving now. Uh, and that's obviously extremely good for alerting us to new invasions and allowing us to record spread um, as you saw for that Harley Quinn ladybird spread map that I showed. Um, insects are quite good for making those pretty maps because they do tend to radio out, radiate out from one place. Uh, plants tend to be less good at doing that they, for whatever reason. Um, so we have quite a complex infrastructure set up around our databases, but I won't go into that because I probably need to leave time for some questions. Um, so finally, are just a few controversial topics that come out of this um, discourse around alien species. And one is that, well, um, if there isn't really a strong distinction between native and alien species, if it's all to do with kind of residence time and when we have a cutoff as to when we call things native, you know, at the moment it's the last glaciation and then anything that arrives without human help after that glaciation is native and if it had human help then it's an alien. So what does that really um, lead us to conclude about climate change? You know, if the climate's changing and where a, cli where a species is, it's no longer going to be suitable for it. And climate's changing so fast relative to um, non-human induced climate change that we've had in the past. Then do we need to do things like move species? Um, do we need to assist in their migration? So do we, are we actually going to end up kind of planning our flora and our fauna? We could select a set of species that are in danger of being um, extirpated at the southern edge of their range where it's getting too hot and move them into Britain. And um, you know, this idea has been floated in the ecological literature and you can see it's, it's met with some resistance. Um, and the original author of the idea, Chris Thomas, here at the University of York actually, um, said, well, there's no alternative. We need to start building our Anthropocene Park and choosing which species we want to come. Want, want to invite in and he came up with a list of things that like the Iberian lynx, the Provence, Chalk Hill Blue, the Spanish Imperial Eagle, um, a set of water beetles from the Iberian Peninsula, all things that are threatened by climate change in their native range or what we call the native range at the moment, but which could potentially make themselves at home in Britain if we introduce them here. So there are probably going to be some quite um, fraught discussions about this topic. At, um, in the years to come and obviously if we did move them would we think of them as honorary natives or would we think of them as aliens and would we start to get worried about impacts on the species that are already here when you start to think about these things it actually gets pretty complicated um, so this is the last slide and just finally I, I've just overviewed the type of skills that I have and some of my uh, colleagues have as well I don't do all of these things although I do use actually most of them uh, 
on a yearly basis, if not a day-to-day -day basis. So obviously taxonomic understanding for dealing with species is extremely important, especially when you're dealing with um, a couple of thousand species that may be observed on any day across the whole of Britain and relating that to global databases um, and possibly the flora of surrounding countries like France and Spain and places like that. So obviously knowing species, including field identification skills is extremely important. I think you do workshops on that here. Um, ecological concepts goes about saying really. Um, database skills such as uh, SQL, learning a bit of basic SQL is always useful if you're going to be dealing with any type of database. Um, statistics is essential, I would say, to ecology or at least doing ecology well and understanding what you're doing. Um, doing that in, in a programming format, particularly in R, is extremely common now in ecology especially if you go, if any of you do a PhD in the area, I would be extremely surprised if you don't end up using R. It's um, basically de rigueur for ecological analyses these days. Um, and I think that's a very good thing because it allows you to think more about what you're doing rather than using out of the box tools. Um, and GIS as well, and a general enthusiasm for, for natural history. So I hope we've got time for questions, but that's the, that's the end of my talk. Uh, <clears throat>